Born in London in 86, a stash of gent named British Parliament. He loves to wrestle, but he loves one more thing, and goes round the world. He fights in his comments and he argues with fans. It's a problem no one understands. There's two things he loves, it's getting and, and goes round the world. Drinking fine wine, fighting fanboys, handhelds round the world. Top Hat Gaming Man. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Top Hat Gaming Man here, welcoming you to yet another exciting episode of Handhelds Around the World. I am currently still in Transylvania, and this week I find myself in Sigiswara, arguably the most well-preserved medieval town on planet Earth. During my visit I am staying right here, in Europe's last inhabited citadel, which was built all the way back in the 12th century which means this town even predates the existence of the Magnavox Odyssey. Pretty old, eh? Anyway, what would be one of these trips without holding up a handheld in front of a camera, looking as smug as possible? No one would even know that I make it to these delightful locations otherwise. The system I am holding today in my large western palms is obviously the subject at hand. This device is an extremely unique one, with a backstory as interesting as any. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of the GP32, the Game Boy Advance's more powerful competitor. Yeah! The year is 2001. After many years, it was finally time for Nintendo to give the 8-bit Game Boy a true successor. Sure, we received the Game Boy Color, that finally gave the system crude colour graphics, but to be honest, that was kind of more of a final hurrah for the platform, rather than a true sequel. You could argue that Nintendo would have possibly even tried to milk their 8-bit platforms a little further, if it wasn't for the credible threats that were arising that could have taken Nintendo's handheld crown. The most famous examples of these from the end of the original Game Boy's era came in the form of the 16-bit Neo Geo Pocket Color and Bandai Wonderswan Color, which was even designed by Gunpei Yokoi himself, the very man who designed the original Game Boy. Nintendo would respond to this by answering the challenge with a more powerful handheld of their very own, and as we all know, the rest is history. The Game Boy Advance would go on to be yet another one of the most popular handhelds of all time, which was aided by the fact that it felt like such a huge upgrade from the 8-bit Game Boy. But what if I told you there was an even more powerful system than the Game Boy Advance that was released the same year, but unfortunately is rarely talked about today and is even historically in the shadows of the more obscure Neo Geo Pocket and Wonderswan devices as well. You would say, yes Mr Top Hat Gaming Man, we all come here to bask in your greatness as our benevolent teacher of all things obscure and underappreciated. This after all isn't a story a Jedi would tell you about. So this is the GP32, a device released in 2001 that was developed in South Korea. If you have been watching my channel for a while, you will be fully aware that South Korea has a rather unique gaming history that differs from other regions in the world. Throughout the 80s and 90s, Japanese companies such as Nintendo, Sega and Sony pretty much dominated the console market. However, in South Korea, history would unfold a tad differently. This was due to a number of trade laws unique to South Korea that would inhibit Japan from trading with them over the periods. The embargo was in place due to a number of complex reasons, triggered by the relationship between the two countries, most notably Japan's refusal to apologise for using Korean women as sex slaves during World War II. Regardless of this, after the fallout of the war, both countries would ultimately end up as powerful capitalist driven nations. And when it comes to capitalism, when there is a will, there is a way and usually a handy loophole to help you through. Japanese companies would find a way of selling their products in South Korea by partnering up with local Korean companies and distributing their products under Korean branding. 
in regards to this we have already looked at some of these examples in the past on this channel such as the Super Nintendo being rebranded as the Hyundai Super Convoy and the PC Engine being branded as the Daewoo Vista. However, as impressive as this tactic was to get Japanese consoles onto Korean shores, they were still never that popular historically. South Korea is a country that remained dominated by PC gaming, which means it could be inferred, much like the Japanese, Koreans prefer to buy products created at home. I cannot imagine all people in the country being particularly happy with lining the pockets of the nation's trade enemy. By 1996, the South Korean government had begun to take notice of the success that Japan were having on a global scale, with regards to the game consoles they were creating. The nation, as a result, were keen to find a way to try and break this monopoly, which would lead to the government themselves launching an initiative to find a company to create a South Korean-designed gaming platform. Basically, the South Korean government decided to fund the company that would create a console to compete against the monopolized Japanese market. A contest was held and Game Park was the winning company. Game Park was set to create the first portable video game system from Korea. So, let me just repeat myself. This was a government sanctioned device, which was essentially created using taxpayers' money. This isn't something completely out of the ordinary to be fair, as a similar initiative took place in my own country, the UK, back in the early 80s, when the British Broadcasting Corporation, aka the BBC, which is also completely paid for by the country's taxpayers, would team with Acorn to build the BBC microcomputer range as part of the BBC literacy project that existed to get computers within every school in the UK. However, I guess this initiative is slightly more layered than simply trying to create an entertainment project to shallowly compete with the Japanese. So, whilst as covered, development would begin on the handheld all the way back in 1996, back in the time period where 32-bit gaming handhelds simply didn't exist. It would not be until the year 2000 though that consumers would even get a glimpse of this state-funded product. Hilariously, the GP32 was unveiled at the Tokyo Game Show. At this point in time, prototype models of the device were shown off. However, the GP32 failed to garner any attention due to no games of note being present. After the presentation, Game Park will continue to work on the development of their upcoming handheld. Along the way, other design concepts were presented. By this point in time, Game Park were also facing a new issue for recently announced Game Boy Advance, a Japanese handheld which was much more powerful than what Game Park themselves had planned to release at that point. This would require them to go back to the drawing board, upgrading their hardware and coming up with something even more powerful than Nintendo's offering. So, then after a long, more than five year development cycle and all that taxpayers money, the GP32 would finally launch in South Korea in November of 2001. The GP32 was a system that was positioned completely differently from that of the GBA. In fact, the system was as far removed from the marketing and purpose served of a Japanese game system that a gaming device could possibly be at that time. At launch, the system would debut with five games. However, the main difference between the GP32 and the GBA was that it was an open source handheld gaming platform, which meant it was aimed to be an attractive prospect for indie developers. The open source nature of this device was the unique selling point that Game Park were hoping to capitalize on and make a success with of their product. The most exciting opportunity the Game Park presented would be that it would allow developers to release games on the system completely royalty free, which would be the polar opposite experience to developing games on Nintendo systems. On top of the device's open source nature, it was also capable of supporting both audio and video playback. This would include the ability to listen to music downloaded when connected to a PC via the use of the MP3 format. 
A GP32 purchased at retail could only run encrypted games and tools, however consumers could register their devices as a development unit in order to get a free suite of development tools to create their own programs. The Game Park was planned to be a platform that offered the tantalising prospect of being a system that was both more powerful and more useful than the GBA, and Game Park were banking on their user base to create a range of homebrew games to help support the hardware. Approved homebrew titles were even published on their website. The open source functions of the device would result in various additional applications being made for the handheld beyond just handheld games. This would include alternative firmware, file managers, emulators, a DIVX player, and image slideshows. In terms of emulation on the system, the little handheld that was assisted by, at the time, a very powerful ARM 920T CPU was very good at emulating 16-bit era console games. This in turn would make the GP32 one of the world's first ever commercially available handhelds that could function in such a manner. For Game Park, the trade laws that existed within South Korea would give the GP32 a huge advantage in the region. However, in January 2002, this would all change, as the trade law that inhibited the import of Japanese electronics was finally lifted. Due to this huge change in the market, Game Park were forced to compete against Nintendo now on equal footing. It was around this point that Game Park would begin distributing their handheld in other countries around the world. This would include Portugal, Italy, Spain, Sweden and the United Kingdom. However, I must say, I was big into my gaming and have no recollection of this platform's launch whatsoever. Games for the console were also distributed in innovative ways for the period. Commercial games were available via regular boxed retail purchases or via internet downloads. The games purchased at retail came on smart media cards, which I must say are pretty snazzy looking little things. By the latter part of 2002, the system still only had 13 games amongst its library and a revised model of the device was released with a front lit screen. The front light was the only change that took place here, so Game Park would modify unsold existing units and refashion them to include this new feature. Moving into the following year of 2003, by the end of these 12 months, the GP32 had fallen light years behind the GBA in terms of sales, even though the library had inflated slightly to now include 25 different physical games. The open source nature of the device, however, meant that the system still had an active homebrew scene. So, in one final effort to make the system more economically viable, another hardware revision would take place in 2004. The next model, known as the GP32 Blue, featured a backlight as opposed to a front light, and a few more games would see release that year. Throughout the system's life cycle, only 28 different commercial titles were ever released, with the final of these coming out in December of 2004 which was a little platforming RPG known as Blue Angelo. Whilst commercial releases were limited, as mentioned though, homebrew titles and various emulators would add to the amount of different games you could experience when playing on this little machine. As you would expect, the GP32 would be a commercial failure, shifting reportedly only 30,000 units worldwide. The concept simply never caught on well enough to grab mass consumer attention and was not marketed well enough for most people to even know this bloody thing existed in the first place. Maybe if the device had more of a marketing oomph behind it and Game Park made the effort to secure more development support for the system, the story could have been slightly different. In fact, some reports suggest that an idea was thrown around at one point to get many PlayStation games ported over to the system, as the PlayStation was not released in Korea at all, which could have opened up some very different scenarios historically. However, as we know, this never happened, so I can see no possible way the GP32 could have slowed down the success of the Game Boy Advance, no matter how powerful. Despite this though, the handheld has an interesting unique history behind it, and whilst it failed to capture even the Korean market, that does not mean that Game Park would not go on to release further handhelds down the line. This was not the end of the Game Park story. 
These, however, are all stories for future episodes of Handhelds Around the World. So you will have to watch future editions in order to see that. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the story of the GP32, the Game Boy Advance's more powerful competitor. Maybe we will revisit this system down the line to talk about the games that this thing offers. But I hope for now that I, at the very least, built up a picture for you regarding this device's functions, history and purpose. Please leave your thoughts on today's video in the comment section down below. And please consider hitting the like, subscribe button and notification bell to stay informed with regards to whenever I upload content. Finally, my channel is partially funded by the generous donations I receive via Patreon. Patrons can earn a credit and a shout out at the end of these videos. These people make working full time on YouTube just that little bit less scary. So I would like to thank you all very much for that. So a huge shout out to Carl Johnson, JD Robbins, Sebastian the Great, Sid Spaces, Andrew Bazansky, Asobi Quang DX, Michael Baker, Tom Elliott, Computer Man, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Daniel Daly, Retroversing.com, Harrison for Ted, Dan Barlow Jr., and all of my other patrons. Yeah. Cheerio.